101 class, you'll remember that those cells in your GI tract turn over faster than any cells in our body. So that requires an enormous amount of energy. So the fact that almost all glutamate is used for pathways as an energy for those cells, that helps preserve glucose to go in to keep our serum glucose levels at an even level because we all know that our brain can only use glucose as an energy source. And if we don't have an even amount of glucose in our serum getting to our brain, we kind of plunk over, right? So body, the body has a lot of different mechanisms to make sure, as you know, uh, hormonal mechanisms to make sure that glucose stays in a nice range. And one way that we conserve glucose is by using glutamate as a source of energy for these mucosal cells. This is just kind of a fun fact, but I do think it points back to Dr. E Dr. Beer's um, comments about the essentiality of, of glutamate. There's about 10 times the level of free glutamate in breast milk as there is in cow's milk. And I think we kind of have to ask ourselves that if it wasn't really important for us, would we be producing that level of glutamate in, in breast milk um, for, for infants as they develop? So that's kind of the nutrition and biology part. Now we're gonna talk a little more on a food science side um, about glutamate um, in foods. And I just talked about um, free glutamate in breast milk, right? So glutamate can either be, we talked about it, it's an amino acid, and it can either be tightly bound in protein and Chris alluded to that from a culinary sense, or it can be a more of a free form, and it's that free glutamate that interacts with receptors to give us the umami experience. So this just has some numbers to back up some of Chris's comments. Um, you know, cheddar cheese and the amount of free glutamate is gonna depend on how much that cheese has aged. Um, Parmesan cheese is one of the highest sources of dietary glutamate in terms of concentration, um, you know, tomatoes, corn. Um, and as we talked right before lunch, there are a variety of things that help loosen up that glutamate from that tightly bound form in a protein complex to where it's available as a source of, of umami and those things include ripening or aging or, or simply cooking. Um, there are compounds that will work with glutamate to give an even richer umami experience, and these are called ribonucleotides. And the reason we say the age-old wisdom of chefs is because chefs for years have combined these ingredients for this flavor impact and might not have even known what a ribonucleotide was, but um, certainly the, the effect was to have more of an umami um, experience. And as Chris said, it's not necessarily additive. It can be one plus one equals four, or one plus, four e one, plus one equals 15. Um, so the inosinates, um, adenylates, uh, guanylates, um, and mushrooms are all examples of those ribonucleotides. And there's a reason for that. So um, Dr. Beecham, please don't laugh at my slide here, but essentially if we think about the receptors as being kind of like a little Venus flytrap, and when glutamate comes into that receptor, you get that triggers the umami experience. But if you've got a ribonucleotide there, you get a doubled up effect and that receptor kind of is, is more stable. It is a deeper experience. So that's kind of a, a very general biological basis and this work was published in, in 2008. So now let's talk about MSG monosodium glutamate. And one of the things that um, Tia asked as we were putting this, this talk together was to try and address some of the common uh, questions that um, we've heard over the years about MSG. And I probably won't go into every one of those, but again, what I want to do is to try and set the kind of the biological basis so you can answer some of those for yourself. Um, so on the, on the left, you see glutamic acid, and on the right you see MSG, and all that is means is that a sodium has replaced that hydrogen there on the, the end of the hydroxyl group there on the right. Um, you could have other positive ions that are attached to that glutamate molecule. Um, sodium has a nice flavor pro profile. Um, it's, it's stable, 
Um, so that's one of the reasons that we have MSG instead of, uh, you know, potassium glutamate, I guess, in terms of popularity. Um, and the important thing is that the body recognizes MSG the same as it does a free glutamate. So, you know, when we talked about that water, the, the, when glutamate gets into water and that dissociation, so you're going to end up with, with free glutamate either way. Um, a lot of people, you know, ask questions about how MSG is made, and they think it's made in some, you know, deep laboratory somewhere, or some heavy-duty factory. Really, the process is... is we said earlier is basic fermentation. So you start with a carbohydrate source, it might be molasses, it might be corn. You extract that sugar. That sugar serves as a nutrient source in the fermentation broth. You end up with uh, glutamic acid in that broth. You separate it out. You purify it. You dry it. You crystallize it. And you stick it in one of those little containers and you've got MSG, a very self shelf-stable form um, for, to enhance umami. Um, these numbers are a little different than, uh, well, actually, it's the next slide that talks about, but this addresses it somewhat, um, in terms of um, glutamate intake and MSG intake. So in the United States, and this comes from, FDA actually has a really good Q&A on their website um, that's written in very basic terms about MSG. And in that fact sheet, they say the average consumption in the US is about a half a gram a day. Um, if you look at total glutamate consumption in the US, it's about 13 grams. Um, this varies a lot from country to country. And this is a slide that I was thinking of just now, um, where Jordan had showed the, uh, the map. Um, in the US, see we're at about a half a gram. Um, you get to Japan, about a gram and a half. You get up to Taiwan, you're upwards of three, three grams per day. The reason that there's, some of those bars are in different shades is just represents different, different surveys. But the point is, I think these numbers are consistent with what Jordan showed directionally. It's just the numbers are a little bit different. So um, you can see it varies widely from country to country. Um, one of the things that we have not really talked about today, um, I, I, I know that there can't be a person in the room who has not um, heard the dietary recommendations that have grown over the last decade or two about um, reducing dietary sodium intake um, and strategies to do that. The problem is we know that, low, or at least maybe I'm speaking for myself, when low sodium food to me is pretty bland. I actually like salt a lot. Um, so it is tough to get people to stick to a low-sodium diet. And one of the interesting things that we found is that we can reduce the amount of sodium, add a little bit of MSG back in, and people can't tell the difference. Their sensory rankings in terms of enjoyment and palatability are unchanged. My, um, I came in with my colleague Amy Philpott, and she has confirmed with me that she is regularly using this with her husband, and he has not noticed yet, and she thinks she's getting her salt down by about a third for him. Um, so the Food Nutrition Board in 2010, um, the IOM, uh, published this report on strategies to reduce sodium, and they recommended sources of umami as a means to get, get sodium down. Um, you might say, well, why is that the case? Because monosodium glutamate, duh, there's sodium in MSG. Um, it's a much, relative to, to weight, it's a much lower amount. So only about 12% sodium in MSG versus about 39% um, in um, salt or sodium chloride. So it's kind of a rule of thumb. It's the kind of thing that if you are playing around with it at home, you really will need to play around with it. But kind of a rule of thumb is to take sodium, excuse me, take salt to about two thirds or so of um, what you would normally use and add about a third of MSG back in. But it's going to depend on what you're making and the flavor profiles of that particular dish. 
This is an example that we have on our website. It is um, a black bean recipe that I think is an American Heart Association. We took from the American Heart Association cookbook. And you can see you know, the, the way that that recipe was modified and you end up with a 34% reduction of sodium. So is that gonna you know, radically take away any concerns about dietary sodium? No, probably not. But I tell you what, if you're on a low sodium diet and you want to enjoy some black bean soup, I think this would be a nice, um, a nice thing for you to try. And I think 34% is a pretty meaningful reduction. So let's talk a little bit about, about safety. Um, back in 1958, the US FDA determined um, MSG to be grass or general, generally recognized as safe. Um, in 1987, JECFA, which is the you know, Food Standards Organization through um, the um, FAO and World Health Organization, um, said that the ADI, or acceptable daily intake for MSG, was not specified, which sounds a little bit scary, like, what do you mean it's not specified? But actually, that's their way of saying that this, this ingredient um, does not need an upper intake level. Under, under current usage, and that really puts MSG in the safest of all food categories, so there's not an upper limit with JECFA. Um, in 1995, um, I think in, to some extent in reaction to some of the public questions and concerns about MSG, um, FDA sponsored a very extensive evaluation of safety um, using, uh, through FASIB. And the results of that uh, confirm that, you know, under normal terms of use, MSG is, is a safe ingredient. But what about all of these things that we hear anecdotally, the cramping and the headache and the itching? Um, I think we've, we've all heard that. Um, and it certainly has been, um, Looked, it has been the source of many studies since these concerns began to be raised. And I, I think it was Jordan who mentioned it was raised through a, um, a letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine, 1968, I believe. Um, Dr. Kwok said he had observed that he noticed people eating, many people eating in Chinese restaurants had these kinds of symptoms. He did not attribute it to MSG. He listed MSG as one of multiple possibilities that could be the cause of this, but, but out of that grew what we commonly refer to today as Chinese restaurant syndrome. Um, as I said, this has been um, studied um, pretty extensively, and um, I'm gonna just quote from a review here that was published in the Journal of Nutrition. Um, basically what you find is that when you when you bring volunteers in who say that they experience these symptoms as a result of, of MSG, and you put them in a double-blind placebo, placebo trial, and you try and recreate those symptoms, um, it is not reproducible. Um, so I think we have to be really careful, and I, you know, I get these questions whenever I'm working on behalf of TGA, um, regardless of whether you're a dietitian or a cab driver or a teacher. And I never ever try and tell anyone that they or their cousin are not experiencing whatever they're experiencing. Um, but I do think it's important that people explore with their physicians these symptoms because there really is not a biological basis. It's not biologically plausible that this amino acid is, is causing these symptoms. Um, so again, I, like I said, I, I, don't, I never wanna tell anybody that something's not real because it clearly is real, um, but I, I think it's highly unlikely that it's related to, to glutamate consumption. And in fact, in 2018, um, MSG was removed from 
the um, International Classification of Headache Disorder. Up until that time, it had been um, listed as part of that, uh, in that categorization, I guess you would call it. So there are about five reasons why that really shouldn't be surprising to us, right? And I'm going to kind of recap some of the things that we talked about earlier. Um, first of all, glutamate is the most prevalent, one of the most prevalent amino acids that we have in our bodies and in our diets, okay? Second, the body doesn't distinguish between added MSG and MSGs in the diet. One of the first things I usually ask people if they say that someone they know has symptoms, I ask them whether they have the same symptoms when they grate Parmesan cheese on top of their spaghetti because they're probably getting a bigger dose with that than if some went into the, some MSG was used in the spaghetti sauce. Um, as I've said, food sources far, per, um, far surpass the amount of, of added MSG in our diets. And coming back to that statement about um, the mucosal cells using MSG, or excuse me, glutamate, as an energy source, if you are looking at blood levels of glutamate, and, you, and, and we have measured this, you don't get increases in serum levels of glutamate just because glutamate is added to the diet or added to the food. So you can um, test people before, test people after. Now, can you create a situation where you are able to get an increase? You can because you can inject glutamate into the bloodstream, bypass the gut, That'll give you an increase, and that's one reason why it's really important to look at studies that talk about, particularly animal studies, that talk about impacts because many of those studies were done where they injected um, glutamate into the bloodstream. Um, if you fast a person for you know, 12 hours, bring them in, don't give them any food, and give them a heavy-duty bolus of straight glutamate, um, can you create some? Yeah, you may be able to create a symptom then, but under normal terms of the diet, you don't get increases in serum glutamate. Um, oh, okay. I guess I, I jumped the gun on that one. But um, um, These are citations, and I think you've got these uh, slides are being supplied to everyone, so don't feel like you have to write these down. These are just a few of the um, sources that I pulled from in terms of the comments here. So. Um, if you have questions about how some of these studies were done and some of the reviews, I would encourage you to, to take a look. But we all know that there are a lot of misperceptions that exist, right? Um, and so to that end, um, Ajina Moto recently worked with Edelman to conduct a study, uh, uh, just an opinion study um, of um, registered dietitians, um, chefs, and consumers. And, I'm just going to share a couple of um, uh, results from that, from the um, dietitian piece of that survey. So um, let me kind of explain this because I know it's a little bit of a busy slide, but um, the question was asked, um, thinking about different ingredients and elements in food, how favor favorable are you toward each of the following? Um, and so ask about protein, okay? What's not to like about protein if you're a registered dietitian? I mean, really, so 80, 87%, the, the favorable is the dark blue. Um, umami, now you're getting kind of a mix, you know, half and half, the, the gray means, well, I'm not either favorable or unfavorable, um, or favorable toward umami, and I think that probably reflects some lack of um, understanding of what umami is. Caffeine was thrown in there as a, you know, just a marker. You typically do that if you're testing a, a uh, you know, a number of components is to kind of give you an anchor. Um, then ask about glutamate. Well, single amino acid, you know, I can, there's not a lot to love or not love, so that was a pretty neutral response, but certain, and only about 18% favorable, 69% neutral. But then you get to MSG and you see that red bar shoots, shoots up to about 60%. Um, then ask another, uh, a series of other statements and ask about agreement with those statements on 
you know, whether uh, they believe that MSG was derived from natural ingredients, whether they believed it contained less sodium than table salt, and whether they believed it was safe. And again, you're getting kind of 50-50 on these, on these different um, questions. So some of you may say, ooh, that's, that should be worrisome. I actually, and I'll come back to this in, after the next slide, I actually think it shows huge opportunity and, and actually has a very positive side, which I'll get to in a second. But before getting to that, just in looking at the different segments, I didn't pull data from the others, but um, chefs, if you look at chefs and dietitians, there was, neither of those groups had a really high association between MSG and umami. So not high recognition on the fact that it is MSG and glutamate that triggers that umami experience. Um, but as an ingredient, chefs were actually more favorable and, and had decent MSG favorability ratings. So that was positive. When you move over to, conserv uh, to consumers, they're gonna be less favorable to MSG as an ingredient or flavor enhancer. And that's not surprising given that, you know, the number of food companies that decided they would market no MSG on their, on their products, which I think is a huge disservice to consumers. Um, and, cons and the consumers are less aware of the relationship between umami and glutamate even more so than um, than the other groups. So let me tell you why I actually am optimistic at these results. And it didn't just happen in this survey, it also happened in a survey that we did at TGA back, I think it was in 2011 or so, um, um, and that was among consumers. And what we found was that just single exposure to these messages that you see here, which were most of which were tested in the, the recent survey as well as in 2011. So if you just test people saying, how would you react if you knew that there's a sodium reduction benefit by using MSG? How would you react if you knew that the um, safety assessments have confirmed safety for more than three decades? How would you react if you knew that glutamate was naturally present in foods? So this is not a lecture, this is just taking a survey. And if you do a pre-survey and you do a post-survey, you find that single exposure to this information takes attitudes about MSG way up. So I don't think we are dealing with a situation that is not possible to change because you know, we all, you know, and, and I lecture all the time about how food issues are emotional and you can't change people based on fact. But I can tell you, this is a case where when people get exposure to these facts, they really do change their opinions. Um, so I think there's a huge opportunity. And I would also say that um, we've been monitoring basic media on MSG for years and years. And we have seen a radical change in the last four to five years in terms of the tone and the content and the, um, I was going to say positivity, that's probably not a word, um, of articles in cutting edge, um, more trendy uh. journals, more, um, you know, journals for people who are maybe uh, a little more informed, you know, NPR, the SALT, I'm just thinking of some of the ones we've seen, the Smithsonian, uh, National Geographic, um, the New Yorker. I mean, so, and even in like Huffington Post and BuzzFeed, and the, the message in every one of those has been, this whole thing is an urban myth, and umami is terrific, and MSG, is a pretty easy way to add umami to your food. So I am actually very optimistic, um, and I think that this meeting is, is a great step forward toward getting these messages out. And again, I thank Ajinomoto for allowing me to participate.